Well, good evening and delighted that you're joining with us for this evening service of our Harvest Thanksgiving. Quite different than we would be used to, of course, but nonetheless, I trust that it will be a meaningful uh, service of worship for us as we reflect upon the Lord's goodness and provision for us uh, throughout another year. Just to remind you of the services that do meet in the church on a Lord's Day at 11 a.m., and then on a Tuesday evening at 8 p.m. for Bible teaching and corporate prayer. And then our online provision continues with our morning and evening services and also our daily devotionals and also a Tuesday evening Bible teaching and prayer as well. We would, of course, love that you would be able to join with us in person, but where circumstances still mean you have to stay where you are and isolate yourself then I trust that these online services will be a means of encouraging you, of pointing you to Christ and enabling you to grow in his grace and in his love. Well, let us worship God together. Let us hear the psalmist. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and exalt your name forever and ever. The choir are going to lead us in an introit. I praise you for your faithfulness, after which we shall all join in worship of God, Lord of creation. To you be all praise.
Well, on these Sunday evenings, we're working our way now through the book of Proverbs. And as we have been doing, just encouraging you to engage with the reading. If you are watching this on a screen, then you'll be able to read the alternate verses. I'll read the odd numbered. You join with me in the even numbered as we listen to God's word together. Proverbs chapter two. My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding. And if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He holds victory in store for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in, whose walk is blameless. For he guards the course of the just and protects the way of his faithful ones. Then you will understand what is right and just and fair, every good path. For wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will protect you and understanding will guard you. Wisdom will save you from the ways of wicked men, from men whose words are perverse, who leave the straight paths to walk in dark ways, who delight in doing wrong and rejoice in the perverseness of evil, whose paths are crooked and whose, who are devious in their ways. It will save you also from the adulteress, from the wayward wife with her seductive words, who has left the partner of her youth and ignored the covenant she made before God. For her house leads down to death and her paths to the spirits of the dead. None who go to her return or attain the paths of life. Thus you will walk in the ways of good men and keep to the paths of the righteous. For the upright will live in the land and the blameless will remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the land and the faithful will be torn from it. We thank God for this, his precious word. Well, let us pray together. Almighty, gracious and loving God, as we bow before you on this harvest Thanksgiving day, we rejoice again in the provision you have made for us. Lord, the promise given oh so long ago still stands, seed time and harvest has not failed. We do thank you, Father, that as we go about in our shops, we still see plenty of food and variety at that. There is sufficient for our needs and much more besides. And yet we are mindful, of course, of many people for whom this is not true. For Lord, there are people whose crops have not given them a good harvest. There's people who have known famine, people who have known floods. And Lord, any hope of a harvest has been destroyed. We do pray for them, we remember them before you and we ask that in your mercy you would draw near to them. We give you thanks too for the harvest of the sea. Lord, we thank you for those who go out into dangerous waters at times and bring in the fish and enable us to eat food. Father, we thank you for your provision for us in every way. And as we come to you today, we're mindful that all good gifts around us are sent from heaven above. And so we give you thanks for all your goodness and grace toward us. Above all, we thank you for the harvest in the spiritual world. Lord, we thank you that day and daily, not only is good seed of the word being sown and scattered, but Lord, it is also bearing fruit in the lives of men and women and boys and girls. We rejoice that you are still building your church and Lord, the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. Father, as we meet together this evening, offering you the worship and praise of our lips and of our lives, we pray that you would make us ever more thankful for all your mercies toward us. And Lord, forgive us for the times when we have complained or when we have grumbled. Grant to us the grace of your Holy Spirit that as we worship you this night, we may know your presence with us and that your word may dwell richly in our hearts 
so that we may feed upon that word, grow strong in our faith and live lives that truly honour and glorify you for the sake of your dear Son, our Saviour, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, let us join together in singing uh, the hymn which reminds us of the many, many blessings that are ours. Count your many blessings, name them one by one. we turn to read together in the word of God and we're reading this evening in Paul's letter to the Romans chapter 2 and at verse 1 <clears throat> the word of God you therefore have no excuse you who pass judgment on someone else for at whatever point you judge the other you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth so when you, a mere man, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance and patience, not realising that God's kindness leads you toward repentance? But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will give to each person according to what he has done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honour and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil first for the Jew, then for the Gentile, but glory, honour and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile, for God does not show favouritism. 
All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law, and all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law, since they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts now accusing, now even defending them. This will take place on the day when God will judge men's secrets through Jesus Christ, as my gospel declares. Amen. We thank God for this reading in his own inspired and inerrant word. We're going to listen to the choir as they sing the song For the Gifts of Heaven, following which we'll all join together to sing verses 8 to 11 of the metrical psalm number 33.
encourage you to have your Bible open at Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 2. Of one of the many reasons given by people as to why they do not become Christians, one of the most popular is the excuse made on the basis of what they believe about the goodness of God. Uh, you know the sort of attitude I am talking about. When we talk about sin and when we talk about judgment, we have people who say, well, that's not the God I believe in. The God I believe in wouldn't do such things. The God I believe in is a loving God. And what they do is, of course, they set the truth of who God is in his loving, gracious, kind and good nature over against who God is, a holy, just and righteous God. And of course, they say these things are incompatible. So we're siding with the God of love and a God of love will never send me to hell. Well, it was that sort of attitude that Paul wanted to challenge when he was writing, because he was writing in the first chapters of Romans, explaining to us really the sinfulness of the entire human race. He starts with it quite generally in chapter one where he reminds us of how by nature we set up our own idols in our hearts and we worship created things rather than the creator. Then in chapter 2 he begins to deal with the Jews as well and explain how they too are under God's judgment but how even those who are not Jews still have the law of God written on their hearts, on their consciences and that this law it is that condemns them. So that we're all left without excuse for there's not one of us who hasn't sinned and fallen short of God's glory. But there was this attitude that God's goodness to us showed that God would always be good to us. Whereas Paul wants to argue, and he does so here in Romans 2 and in verse 4 and 5, Paul wants to argue, you know, God's goodness toward you is not something that allows you to sit back and think, God will always act in that way towards you, but rather that God's goodness is designed to bring you to Christ. And so that's what we're going to look at this evening. And the first thing we're going to look at is the kindness of God shown toward us. The kindness of God shown toward us. Here you have it in verse 4. Do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance and patience, not realising that God's kindness leads you towards repentance. Today, as we celebrate uh, a harvest thanksgiving and as we celebrate God's provision for us in another year, there is perhaps no better time to reflect upon the kindness of God or as the apostle describes it, the riches of his kindness, tolerance and patience. Now, of course, the reality is that we, especially in the time, have become so familiar with the fact that we can go to our local stores any time of the year and buy practically whatever we want. I still recall the days when you only got strawberries in June. Now you can have strawberries all year round. And there is a sense in which we lose something of the sense of our dependence upon Almighty God and our dependence upon the farming community because there is just always food to be had. There's always what we want. And not only what's produced locally, but what's brought in from overseas as well. And we almost expect this to be the way with us. And yet, of course, Paul would want to remind us that these things are all signs of God's goodness and kindness toward us. Paul uses a lovely word here. He talks about the riches of his kindness. The riches of his kindness. It's a word that he uses which speaks about the boundless nature of his kindness. The kindness that never runs out time of kindness. And not only that, but kindness which is shown to us day after day, week after week, month after month. And so the scriptures tell us, of course, that God demonstrates his kindness toward us, no matter who we are. Matthew 5, 40, Matthew 5, uh, 45, he causes the rain and the sun to come on the just and on the unjust, even those who reject him, uh, those who have no time for him. Yet 
He does not stop the rain falling on their fields. He does not stop uh, the sun shining on their fields. No, they benefit from the goodness of God toward us as a whole. You remember how in Acts 14, when Paul is in Lystra and the people uh, want to worship them, want Paul and Barnabas, want to worship them. And they say, don't worship us, we're only creatures. But you and me and people by the million. Indeed, hence the choosing of the hymn, count your many blessings. Have so many gifts. We have the gift of life. We have the gift of health. We have the gift of family. We have the gift of loved ones. We have the gift of a health service. We have so many things that we are so richly blessed with from the moment we are born in our society to the moment we die. We experience the riches of his goodness and they are showered upon us each and every day. And the apostle wants to emphasize to us the extent of God's goodness. And he does so by adding in these couple of words. The riches of his kindness, tolerance and patience. God is rich in his tolerance. And what does that say to us? It says to us that he is kind in spite of what we are as sinners. He's tolerant with us even when we don't acknowledge that the good things have come from his hand. Even when we don't pause but for a few seconds to give thanks at a mealtime. When we take everything that we have for granted and do not acknowledge who he is. He could so easily and rightly and justly strike us down, punish us the moment we sin. But he is tolerant. The riches of his kindness, riches of his tolerance and the riches of his patience. Because for some people he's been tolerant for a long time, a long time. Think of what age you are. Think of the years that have gone. Think of how many harvests have come and gone. And in the words of Jeremiah 8.20, still you are not saved. And so the Lord has not only poured out his riches upon you over all these years, but during all those years when you did not acknowledge him and have not acknowledged him, he's been patient with you. He's been tolerant with you. The riches of his kindness his tolerance and his patience toward us. You see, here is one advantage our, our country, fellow countrymen have working uh, in the gardens and fields and dependent upon the produce. They are much more conscious of their utter dependence upon God for all that they have and all that they gather. And we need to come back again to that sense of dependence upon God, thankfulness to God. But what is God's intention in all this kindness, tolerance and patience that is lavished on us? Because you see, it's not so that we might presume in his goodness. This is the argument that Paul wants to counter and this is the argument that is so prevalent today. God is good, God is kind, God is loving, God won't do this or God won't do that. But you see, that is to be presumptuous. That is to presume because God's kind to me, he always has to be kind to me. Because God's good to me, I must be good enough and hence God will always be good to me. But no, it's purpose. Do you not realise that God's kindness leads you towards repentance? Now this word leads you is a very interesting word. Because it's a word that speaks to us of a constraining influence. A bit like the bridle that we might have on a horse. It is used to constrain the horse. Now we can't force the horse because the horse is much stronger than us. But we can direct the horse. We can direct the way it goes. And the bridle is used to that end. And you see God's purpose in all this is to constrain you in your mind, in your affection, in your heart, to realise that God has blessed me in these so many ways and I have taken all this for granted. And I do not deserve the least of his blessings. These things are to bring you to 
repentance. That is their purpose, to bring you to repentance. And so here is what the Lord is doing. The Lord is showing his kindness, his goodness, his love toward us in order to bring us to know him. And of course, the scriptures underscore this in so many ways. 2 Peter 3, 9, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all might come to repentance. Ezekiel 33, 11, God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Or Matthew 23, 57, when Jesus stood outside Jerusalem and said, how often I would have gathered you, but you would not. Now you see, what's Paul saying to us? Well, he's saying to us, surely, this leaves us without excuse. It leaves us without excuse. And so it does, but it conveys to us much more than that. Because it's not just the Lord is not saying, take me or leave me. But he is constraining us by all he has made known to us to admire him, to thank him, to worship him, that we might truly acknowledge him. You see, all that you see about you is not just a token of God's faithfulness. It's not just a token of God's goodness. All that you see about you, all that you enjoy in life, is but part of God's constraining of you to draw you to repentance, to draw you to acknowledge your need of him. But the second thing we have here, because whilst this is God's intention, what do we see here of man's reaction? Well, the second thing we see is the contempt that we show to God. Paul says, it is possible to be the recipient of all these good things and yet show utter contempt for God. How do we do this? Well, let's take an illustration. Let's take an example of a husband or a wife who might believe that their spouse's goodness uh, to forgive them means that they will forgive his ongoing unfaithfulness. Or a child so believe in their parents' unconditional love that they can steal from their purse or wallet. And so this attitude that thanks for that, but this is what I think of it. Paul's point is that God's kindness is not intended for your admir admiration, but for your repentance. And to assume because God is good, you can do as you like, is to despise his goodness. It is to treat him with contempt. And this, of course, is what we do. The good things in life that are a constraining influence to bring us to faith in Christ. Yet what do we do? We go on with our sinning. We say, oh, God's too good to punish me. We're despising God and all that he has provided for us and we're showing contempt for the riches of his goodness. Now let's ask ourselves a question. Why would you do that? Why would you do that? Well, here's the first thing. He says, do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance and patience, not realising what does that word mean? It means deliberately refusing. It means never sitting down to think it through for yourself. Never considering what is the purpose of all this. We can go back into Romans 1.21. Although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they knew God, although they knew God, they didn't sit down to think of the implications of what this meant. No, rather, they showed contempt for the riches of his goodness. And of course, we have known God's goodness, not only in the temporal harvest, but we have seen God's goodness toward us in the giving of a son. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, how do you... 
How do you show contempt for that? Well, by despising Christ, by rejecting Christ, by refusing Christ. But further, Paul says, not only have we not sat down and thought about this, but he says, verse 5, but because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart. You'll know the saying, you can take a horse to water, but you can't make a drink. God's goodness leads us to repent, but by nature, by nature, we have no appetite for it. By nature, we don't want it. Lord leads us by his kindness to gaze upon the glory of salvation. He brings us, as it were, and shows us Calvary, shows us the salvation he offers, gives us through Christ a glimpse of the glory that can await us. But we have no appetite for it. We have no appetite for it. He gives us, as it were, a sample, a taste of the salvation he offers. We don't find it at all appealing. We don't find it at all attractive. And why is that? Well, we're told. Because by nature, we are dead. And as far as spiritual things are concerned, we're unresponsive. It doesn't lie in your heart as a sinner to repent of yourself. You can't do it. That's why it's so foolish to think that you can put this off. To another day you cannot if God by his grace is speaking to you if now even today he's constraining you if now as you reflect upon his provision and harvest and his provision in Christ you feel like you're being drawn to Christ now is the time when you need to realize for yourself when you need to repent and not be stubborn against those movements of the spirit in your life because you have no guarantee that you will ever have those feelings Again, what's the Apostle's purpose in all this? It is to show us that though God has done so much in giving us of the riches of his kindness, yet our need is of a new heart to appreciate it. That's what our need is, a new heart to appreciate it. Eyes to see, ears to hear. The scriptures record for us that when Jesus taught in parables, those ordinary earthly stories, as we call them, people just didn't get their heavenly meaning at all. They didn't get it at all. Why was that? It wasn't because the story itself was particularly difficult. It's just they had no capacity to understand it. They needed new eyes to see. They needed new ears to hear. And yet, what God has shown us in the riches of his kindness in the harvest is displayed to us in an even more uh, amazing depth in his love to us in Jesus Christ. Because you see, what God provides for us day and daily is in many respects but a pale reflection of what he has provided for us in Jesus Christ. You know, and just as we enjoy all that God has made for us, don't know what your favourite is, strawberries and cream it might be, whatever it is, whatever it is we enjoy, here is God and here is a, a even more enjoyable and eternally enjoyable God to know, to experience. And you see this evening, at this harvest time, or as the prophet says, the harvest has passed and the summer has ended and still there are some of you who are not saved. And this evening, in this harvest time, the Lord is constraining you. He's constraining you. Do you not know that the goodness of God is to lead you to repentance? Do you not know that? Do you not know that's why God has made such a rich provision for you? It is not for you to presume upon. It is for you to respond to and to respond to him in so doing. And so what does the apostle say? Chapter 2, verse 1. You therefore have no excuse no excuse save your own stubbornness yet even today if you're conscious of God's speaking into your heart speaking into your life cry out to him for mercy because not only 
does the Lord show the riches of his kindness toward us, but he also shows the riches of his grace, the riches of his grace that are to draw us to repentance. Well, as you reflect on God's goodness at this harvest time, I pray that that may be the effect in your life, that it will constrain you as you reflect on these things to realize that God is being good to me, not so that I can presume upon him, but so that I might come to him and find the deepest riches of his goodness to me in Jesus Christ. Well, let us pray together. Our loving Father, as we turn before you, we are conscious, O Lord, of how many things we take for granted. And we're all guilty of this. How many things we have presumed upon. And yet day and daily, surely we ought to be giving thanks to you for all you've given us. And all of this is not just to provide us with what we need. But Lord, it is to draw us on after something much richer, something much deeper, something much more meaningful, something much more lasting. And that is the life you offer us in Jesus Christ. Oh, we pray that it may not be true of any listening and sharing in this service this evening, that of them it can say the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and still they are not saved. Oh, grant grace, we pray. Draw them in your mercy to the foot of the cross. Enable them to lift their eyes and see Christ crucified for sinners and confessing their sin. Embrace him as their only hope of their eternal salvation and we ask this in Jesus name Amen Well we're going to sing together in closing the hymn that reminds us that we can see these things and still miss their significance in the hymn Almost Persuaded The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and evermore. Amen. <laughs>